Hello. We're taking a little stroll down Memory Boulevard as we revisit two earlier episodes on injuries and access to sumo. Soul throw! Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dohyo here on Mr. JWAG's channel. Uh, everything old becomes new again. Uh, I was looking through a bunch of the old episodes and I was realizing that several of my earlier episodes have been about things like access to sumo in the English speaking world and injuries in sumo and well, just going through some of the sumo news we've had since the last Basho, it feels like it's ripe to revisit these topics. As fans of Nato Sumo may have noticed, it has gotten a lot harder to find online sumo recently. And also, uh, we seem to be having a lot of injury issues that we've been having for a long time. Uh, I'm talking specifically about the Shona no Umi incident where he clearly was concussed in the ring and was allowed to fight. Uh, sumo has now come up with some sort of concussion protocol that is better than nothing, but still doesn't feel like a real solution. <laughs> I think this is one of those cases where enough people screamed, something must be done, and they're like, here is something. But we're gonna get back to that in a second. Uh, gonna take a little detour. As a lot of you know, uh, my other great sports love other than sumo is baseball. And one of my favorite books of all time is called Moneyball. It's by Michael Lewis, and it's the story, not about gambling, it sounds like gambling, uh, but it's the story of how the Oakland A's, a team with very, very little money, managed to compete every year with the New York Yankees, who could spend millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions more dollars than the Oakland A's. How could the Oakland A's stay competitive? Stats. They managed to dive into the stats and find out which sorts of players were being undervalued in the market. So... This was a huge thing in my life. It got me into fantasy baseball a couple decades ago. Uh, I spent a lot of time and energy doing that. If I met you in any chat rooms back in the day, you were right, Cliff Lee was not overrated. And the beautiful things about stats in baseball are that they tell such a complete story of the game. You can go to baseballreference.com and at your fingertips are all the statistics on baseball in history just free for you to show, just show up and dig through. Now, Sumo has something similar in Sumo Reference, but it doesn't really have the same sort of depth. When I started the Doyu, I was hoping I was going to be able to dig into a lot of the data of Sumo and be able to find some sort of hidden gems and be able to find some stories that people who weren't like data and analysis based may have missed. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> sumo, there are essentially only two stats, so you can't really moneyball it. The two stats are wins and kimarite. Now that doesn't tell you the story of a match. It tells you there was a match and sort of what happened, but it's like a little tweet of a match. There's nothing about the, the drama of the match. Was it an easy match? Was it a hard match? Was it a controversial match? It's similar in other sports where you can't just, you can't quantify the play. How do you have a stat for offensive line? How can you tell by stats who the best offensive line is? You could say percentage of sacks, but if one offensive lineman is really good in football and everyone else sucks, you can't tell that that individual person by stats is better. Now I bring this up because I do not have a background in sumo. I've been pretty honest about this with you all from the beginning. I am a fan. I am not a sumo journalist. I have no added knowledge about sumo that anyone else couldn't get from watching sumo for a few years and digging into the history of the sport. Where I hope I have earned some credibility with you, my lovely audience, is that I show my work. Whenever I assert something, I always try to put up a graphic or some sort of fact to let you know that I'm not trying to fool you and that I know something about what I'm talking about because I looked it up. And I bring this up because of a recent John Gunning article talking about YouTubers who deliver nonsense ideas and bad takes. And I will admit, he was talking about me. <laughs> He was talking in the article about many beliefs, one of them being a belief I have espoused here on the show, check, check the link, uh, that the raised doyo may be leading to more injuries. Now, many people in sumo in the know to say this is bosh, ah, this is sumo wisdom. Now, Moneyball has taught me, do not believe people when they say it's just sports wisdom. If we had listened to the prevailing baseball wisdom from my youth, batting average would be the most important stat for hitters and pitcher wins would be the most important stat for pitchers. Neither of those are the prevailing wisdom now. Now, if you want to go way back to the 1920s, the athletes back then would tell you the way to health is smoking camel cigarettes. And of course, the athlete they got to endorse camel cigarettes was Lou Gehrig, famously known for his health and long life. 
So there is no publicly available data about doyo height injury and like that, at least none that I could find from my limited resources, Google and only being able to read primarily in English. That doesn't mean the data doesn't exist. It just means it is not available to me immediately at this time. So I wanna bring this up because my mind has been changed on this topic. I have talked to a lot of sumo people about it. Now, if I can paraphrase the online debate, it seems to be going a lot like this. It's physics. Man, it's just physics, it's force equals mass times acceleration, so the more you accelerate because of gravity, the more force, more injuries. It's the way it works. Is this the eye test? Did you see Keith Nosato? Mitake Yumi? Come on, kamikaze. <laughs> it's just true. Can we please stop talking about this now, please? So, in the interest of never having to talk about this again, give John Gunning some free time. Go to the Disney Sea. The gondola. We are going to bring up my crowdsourced non-expert opinion on Dohyo Height. Number one, most injuries in sumo happen without you noticing them. Uh, a lot of times when people go Kyujo, it's gonna be like, oh, so-and-so got hurt. I'm like, what? And then I have to go back to the previous match. Like, it's not always a giant spectacular fall. The problem is, is when it is a giant spectacular fall, those are the ones we tend to remember. The Kisano Sato, the Tomakazes, uh, the Shodai recently. So of course, these being the memorable ones, we tend to overrate them in terms of frequency in our mind. Most of the injuries in sumo I seem to see are the ones like Asano Yama two tournaments ago, where he like gets hurt in the match and sort of glances at his shoulder, and then two days later he goes Kyujo because of a shoulder injury. Number two. You do get acceleration from three feet, but not as much as you might think. If you compare a six foot man falling from flat ground and a six foot man falling from three feet in the air, say on top of a dohyo, the acceleration is less than three miles per hour and the amount of time spent in the air is about a tenth of a second. The far bigger problem, to coin a phrase, is the 400 pound man who has just applied forced you to get you to leave the ring. That is probably going to give you a lot more acceleration than just gravity. And also, if he's falling on you as well, quite a lot more mass into that force. Number three, bad falls can happen at any height. When you see bad falls off of a dohyo, it takes longer for them to fall. We see it better. There are cameras right on it. But there's no reason why that specific angle is better for health as opposed to, say, a flat angle. Bad angles can happen on a flat just like they can happen on a steep rake or a deep angle. I don't believe there's any hard data on how many injuries a flat dohyo might cause because rikishi have less reaction time before they land. Uh, they have less time to separate from the giant person who's about to land on top of them. There may be some cases where the raised dohyo does in fact help. We don't have that information because it's not what happens. Four, and perhaps most important, Sumo wrestlers spend maybe 1% of their entire career on a raised dohyo, and all the rest of the time they're on a practice dohyo, which is flat. And that is where most of the injuries occur, because that is where most of the time is spent. Number five. Now this was, uh, some form of this was sort of iterated to me by every single person I asked. Uh, it's not going to change. Make peace with it. So there we go. So yes, my opinion has been changed on this topic all the way since episode 15. I agree with John Gunning. I do not believe that it is a major cause of injury. Major is doing a lot of work in that sentence, but I do not believe it is a major cause of injury. Much in the way I believe that the earth is in fact a sphere, but if you think that parts of the earth are not flat, explain Indiana. Now this brings me to the second part of John Gunning's article, and coincidentally enough, another topic that we have already covered on the deal here. Check it out. Access to sumo in the English-speaking world. Sumo access in U.S. is limited to basically four options. Number one, cable. It's great, it's legal, it's licensed, oftentimes you can get it on demand and live, but it is expensive, you need to rent equipment, the sumo is not available everywhere. I've had numerous friends tell me how hard it is to get NHK in certain cities, and even when they get NHK, sometimes they don't show the sumo, and they have to get it on demand on the highlights, which is the second way you can watch it. Those are available for free online. But, as I've said before, you are asking your audience to pay attention to a sporting event 36 hours after, and that is just not the same experience. Even when the Olympics happen and it's on a different time zone, we still figure out by the end of the day who won the Olympics that day. We don't have a 36-hour lag. The internet exists. You can't expect avid sport fans to not talk about the sport on the internet for hope of spoiling it for people who only watch NHK. 
On the last episode, I talked about wouldn't it be great if there was some sort of magical app that you could subscribe to? Well, there is one. The Grand Sumo app is great. There's a small, small, like four to five dollar subscription fee if you want to get the whole archive that goes back 10 years. It's really great if you want to start, like, do a binge of like, I'm gonna go through Kota Shogiku's You Show. Woo! That's a lot of fun. But it's on your phone. There's no commentary. There's no sort of larger story other than the match itself and every single match is pre-spoiled. It updates immediately with the match once it basically happens in Japan so you can watch it, but the second you get on your phone, it shows you who won the match. And that is absolutely horrible to do to a sports fan. It is a giant design flaw. Imagine if every time you sat down to watch a sports thing, it told you who was going to win right before you even started watching. Which leads us to four, pirate streams. Now, these are usually of low quality. They are usually not that reliable and they get shut down a lot, but they're the only thing that tends to deliver the sumo within sort of the 36 hour period all at once with all the matches. Now, I happen to know that a lot of people watch illegal streams. I have done it on myself on occasion. I know. We don't do it because we're horrible people. Quick sidebar. Let me tell you the tale of a little company called Napster. Now back in the day, uh, if you wanted music and you wanted to hear one song, a lot of times you had to buy like a $20 CD just to get a disc with that one song and a whole bunch of crap on it. And then about 20 years ago, some computer dork decided, hey, these are just computer files on a disc. What if we could just rip them and send them through email? It happened. And Napster became a place where you could just trade music back and forth. Was it illegal? Yes, it was. But the market was speaking on a very, very basic level, saying it's not worth a $20 CD for one good song. So the record company immediately came down with a hard fist. <clears throat> they started blocking swapping sites. They started trying to make examples of people, suing them, and that worked perfectly, and no one ever pirated anything ever again. No, that's not what they did. Uh, people just kept doing it. They just started taking it overseas. People started creating like pirate bays and bit torrents in various ways to stay one step ahead of copyright law. And then, iTunes happened. iTunes just said, hey, if you like that song, do you want to pay like a buck for it and it'll be really good quality, you can listen to whatever you want and it's basically like yours and it's just easy? And we're all like, yes, yes, we will do that. And from there on came licensed streaming and a lot of different ways, we're not gonna talk about the music industry right now, but it was a way for the industry and the consumer to meet in the middle. Now the lesson of Napster for me is people are willing to pay for a product if it is a quality product at a decent price. And I would say, as an English language sumo fan, what I'm looking for is an ability to watch the matches, all of them, on demand, hopefully with some sort of commentary, as soon as they happen, they are able to be watched. So that way we can get around the spoiler issue if people want to do it. Again, I said before, I'm willing to pay a subscription fee for this sort of service. And judge from the crowdsourcing research I've done on Reddit and Facebook, many of you would also be willing to pay for it. I accept that because I do not regularly pay outside of the Sumo app for Sumo, you're not listening to me. I would very, very happily pay more to consume more and better Sumo. Quick sidebar. All right, I have one more sort of uh, overall thought and it does still involve baseball, last baseball thing. I lived for 15 years in Chicago on the north side and you cannot escape the Chicago Cubs. And I used to work actually right down the street from Wrigley Field at a small theater that has since left us. But on game day, you could walk by and you'd hear the game. And when they renovated Wrigley Field in the early 2000s, they added in right field what they call the knot hole. And it's just a big fence area where you can just walk by on the street, look in through the fence, and there's a major league baseball game happening. You can see Wrigley Field and it's so cool. The right fielder's right there. You can get the flavor of the crowd. And although you can't really see the ball when it's hit anywhere but right field, you feel like you're a part of it and you're there. And it makes you want to get inside and see the game that everyone else is seeing. Now I feel like Sumo is caught in this inherent tension between being a beloved cultural artifact and becoming a major professional sport. Now, if it's a sport, you want to look for converts. You want as many people as possible to be able to watch, talk about, be excited about the sport. But if it is something that is uniquely and specifically and exclusively Japanese, then all of us foreign fans are never ever gonna get behind the knothole. 
Fandom is a means of ownership. It's sort of a way of putting your own emotional investment into a sports figure. And in sumo, it's sort of you're putting your investment into the entirety of the sport. And I just want to know if we're wasting our time because we're always going to be on the other side of the knothole. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Dohyo. I have a brand new research project I have just started. I can't wait to share with you, but I'm not going to say what it is because I learned my lesson from the Tamino Umi thing. Uh, and I've got another episode coming up of the Shadow of Hakuho, and of course, my bolder -er predictions for when the Bansake comes out. Everyone stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy, and I will see you next time on the Dohyo.